Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining this session. My name is Mike Anand. I'll be co-presenting today's uh, application analytics uh, DevOps use cases and decision making with Amod Gupta here. Amod is our senior principal product manager. So today we'll talk about what is analytics, what problems we're trying to solve, what are our key use cases. We'll do a deep dive demo into uh, what some of those features and use cases are all about. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, what's coming with our roadmap. Um, and then tomorrow's session, we have another product manager, Nima, who's going to take you guys um, into uh, all the things that are coming into 4.2 and do another deep dive into the sessions and the features. So let's go ahead and get started. So you heard a lot from Jyoti, from our CEO, and from a lot of other speakers throughout the last two, you know, two days. You know, this whole concept about software-defined businesses and how software is helping everybody go through the digital transformation, right? So, uh, you know, traditional retail malls are no longer that. It's, you know, banks are no longer doing the same thing. And what uh, travel industry is not the same. And then, you know, if you think about Ubers of the world or Facebooks of the world, you know, Uber is the largest taxi company, doesn't own a taxi. Facebook has the largest amount of content. And they don't, you know, they're not New York Times or or anything like that. So basically, the key here is that, that software is changing the businesses. And it's helping, and it's the main reason behind the digital transformation that is going on. So why is software so important? And what, what, what we really feel like at AppDynamics is that software is the real reason behind business velocity. And so what that means for IT is that IT needs to respond in real time. And if you really think about it, what that means from a customer experience, that you need to understand what is changing about the users and what is, what is different about their usage patterns. Uh, when you're thinking about having a zero downtime during the holiday season, you really need to stay ahead of the performance problems. And then when you need to reduce the churn time and understand, hey, um, what I can do better to serve my customers and provide them better experience, it's all about being able to release those features faster. So, you know, if you really think about it, when business asks IT and DevOps folks, it's like, hey, what do you need to get this stuff done? It really comes down to having the ability to have the performance data that you get from APM product and then being able to tie that with the business data and be able to do that in real time. Now, if you think about it, um, what's, the, what's the situation today? What's the problem with analytics today? Why is that that people are having so much you know, difficulty getting to this stage. And if you think about it, there's really three types of data sets, right? There's business data that is all about, hey, what's my revenue like? What's my churn? How's my growth doing? Then you've got marketing type of a data, which is like, who are my users? You know, what's my campaign like? Um, uh, what, is, what is the conversion like for a certain number of campaigns that I'm running? And then you've got operations data, which is all about, hey, I want to know the performance. I want to know browser performance, mobile performance. I want to know my application performance, infrastructure, server performance. And then when you really try to dig that information and try to get an answer to a very simple question, which is like, hey, how much revenue impact I have because of performance issues, and give me that for my most important users, you have to think about that you've got to get the revenue data from business side. You've got to get the marketing data to tell you who their users are and what they're doing. And then you've got to get the performance data from um, you know, any of the performance tools that are out there. So stitching that data, because it sits in the silo, it's really a difficult thing to do. And, and, um, and, and most of the products today are not able to do that in real time. So customers, you know, and, and there's a number of different solutions that are out there that do try to solve this. And the way uh, this has been done so far is that traditionally that you get, you get log data coming in from a bunch of different sources. You collect that data. You try to store it. You correlate it. And then you try to make some, analyze, make some analyze and visualize that data to make some sense of it. Now, if you think about it, there's, you know, you're essentially building a haystack and then trying to find out where that needle is in that haystack. You don't even know what that needle is that you're looking for. Right? So add that to the fact that your applications are changing on a you know, very rapid pace. So every time an application changes, because you launched a new feature or something else happened, you know, and business asks for that data, you don't have the data. You're going to have to go back to the developer and say, hey, can, I, can you change the code for the application so I can get this data? And then by the time you get that data, you collect that data. And let's assume that you're able to correlate it. You know, information is going to be backward looking. So, so you know, the challenges here is that not only it becomes a very slow process and it becomes an iterative process, um, it's very costly because you've got a number of different peoples. And if you think about 
cost and opportunity cost and, and, and not being able to be proactive for the, um, with the customers, not being able to know what's going on with their digital journey, um, you cannot basically um, keep up. You cannot keep up from a business perspective. So at the end of the day, what this means for the DevOps folks and the IT folks is that you're unable to unlock the data potential, right? And you know, you've got a number of different specialists. And even though that is there, every single thing is a new concept. You've got to go ahead and get the design of it. You've got to build and test that. You've got to be able to launch that. And then by the time you hope to have some analysis done, you know, oftentimes it's not granular, and it's not going to give you uh, real-time insight. So the, so the light bulb, if you will, never really goes on. What if so, you know, Hera's view, and you saw a similar slide yesterday, um, you know, our opinion is like, what if you knew in real time all the different things that are going on? So here's a, here's a quick screenshot um, that talks a little bit about, um, you know, um, you can name it, you know, any of the theme park vendors uh, that are out there, right? Uh, Disney, Carnival, Paramount, any of them, right? What, do you, what if you knew in real time what the performance impact was um, because of your poor performance? What if you knew, you know, in your theme park, what's, what's the wait time? What are the shopping categories that you're selling? Um, you know, what are, what are basically the most important and most um, popular rides out there? What if you knew how your dining pass sales were doing? What if you knew where your ticket sales were doing and where they were coming from? And what if you knew you can, in real time, look at the trend, look at the performance trend in the real time, not after the fact, but in real time being able to tell and timestamp it that, hey, something is going on with this where I, have, I may have a performance issue that is going on. A similar slide is just, you know, a, a different way to talk about, hey, you know, how's my, how's my wait time, poor performance, you know, food court, um, different types of products that are out there, but essentially communicates the same thing here. And then if you really think about it, there's a number of use cases that the dashboard really is trying to answer for customers, right? Um, the three key ones that we try to do um, that we have heard from a lot of our customers that, that are important ones for our application analytics product are business impact analytics, usage analytics, and advanced performance analytics. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes talking through these use cases and diving in a little bit deeper into what these really mean. Okay, so business impact analytics is all about being able to identify failed individual transactions and re respond within the minutes. So if you guys remember, you know, if you have our APM agents, APM agents are already collecting all the performance data, right? So you have all the performance information, you know who are the customers that are having performance issues. So now what we're doing with the analytics product is that same agents, you're able to now capture all the slow tra and failed transactions and, and tie the business data to it. So remember, we talked about baselining. We talked about our, our way to be able to instrument, tag, trace, and follow. And we talked about looking at every single transaction that is out there and being able to only show you in APM what matters most. With analytics, we can take actually all the transactions that are out there, capture the information about those transactions, tie the business part of it, and then you can then basically in real time slice and dice this data, right? So you can think of what we were doing in the dashboard. You can say, hey, give me this data by customer. Give me this data by uh, a certain geography. Give me this data by, you know, anybody who had more than $100 in their shopping cart. And then you can then do a number of things with that data set, right? You can give that to the customer success team and say, hey, go ahead and, you know, call these customers. Tell them we're having a problem. Or go ahead and offer, you know, send an offer through the marketing channel to say, hey, we realize you had a shopping cart. You were purchasing something. The cart crashed. Here's a 5% coupon. Here's a 10% coupon and come back and purchase it. Now, what we do know from a number of different studies is that, you know, over 75% of the customers are going to give you know, the, your app a second chance if you're being proactive. However, you know, we saw some statistics out there yesterday, 96% don't tell you when the problem is, 81% will leave after one or two performance problems. So being able to be proactive really helps, um, helps not only provide a better customer experience, but it also helps be able to provide, um, uh, protect your brand and make sure that the customer loyalty remains. So using this data, you can answer basically a simple question like, hey, who is my customer? You know, who is this customer that I just got a call about? What they were doing? In this case, you know, customer Jude was booking a flight. She happens to be a platinum customer. Flight was booking to London. And you know, there's an API issue and cost $1,800. 
Now, remember that haystack and needle that we talked about? Here, you're not doing any correlation that is manually done through specialists, right? We have that performance data, we're tying that performance data to business and then making the correlation for you. You can just as easily um, flip this over the head and say, hey, give me all the customers that had poor experience and give me what's the impact of those poor experiences to my bottom line. Now, remember, these are failed transactions, right? So this data never exists in any of your back-end systems. You don't know how many of these customers exist. You don't know how many of these customers actually had the performance issue. And then you don't know what the impact of those performance issues was. And you don't know, more importantly, you can't really reach out to these customers unless they call. Okay, so again, the data here is fully, fully automatically collected, it's correlated, and, and you're doing this analysis in real time. So the next use case is all about usage analytics, right? So this is all about the who, when, the what, who, where, when, and how, right? So if you think about it, what you want to find out is who are my most successful customers? Who are my customers that are driving the largest engagement and adoption of my product? Um, and that's essentially what we're trying to do here. So in this example, you can quickly slice and dice this data to say, hey, most important customers happen to be female, they're existing, they're in certain age, they're shopping mostly in the morning, they're using mobile phone, and you know, are, we're able to provide them with a personalized experience. And then using this information, you, know, you, can, create a, you can create a dashboard like this. Now if you think about it, this use case is really important for a number of different people, right? You can, Think about DevOps and IT then influencing which are the customers that, um, that needs to be, you know, which are the products, which are the customers that you need to influence. Think about it from a product management perspective. Um, we've seen a number of use cases where you, know, you want to use the information to say, hey, I launched this feature. Tell me who are the people that are using this feature. How is the adoption of this feature? Are we making any money off this feature or not? You know, there are a number of different things that you can do here um, by looking at this data in real time and correlating that data um, with your performance um, data that is out there. So the next use case is advanced performance analytics. We'll spend a lot of time today giving you demo about this use case here as well. So this is a use case primarily designed for DevOps folks, right? This is an APM++ use case. Um, APM and steroid, whatever you want to call it. But essentially what we're doing here is we're saying, you know, I want to know about what is my performance about a specific customer or a partner, a key value customer, right? Like let's say that, um, you know, we have had a customer that is a credit card processor and they wanted to know, I want to make sure that I meet 100% of SLA or certain percentage of SLA for a certain retailer. And I want to make sure I don't miss anything uh, and break my SLA contract with this customer, right? So here you're going to be looking at, hey, what's my request like? What's my performance? What's the user experience? What's my cost to serve this customer? And what you're really trying to do here, you're even trying to fix before it even gets to yellow. You're looking at information to tell you, hey, what are the things that are indicating me and telling me that I might have a performance issue? And you want to be able to look that across all your transaction for a key value customer and be able to um, get that piece of information in real time. So I'm, what I'm, what I'm going to do now is um, hand it over to Amod. Amod's going to take you guys through a deep dive into the application analytics architecture, do a quick demo, and then um, we'll, we'll entertain your questions after that. Take it away. You got that? You don't need that? I don't need that. No, this works. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. All right, thanks. Um, thanks, Mike. So Mike took us through the three most common use cases for which we build analytics. Um, it's important for us to identify those three important use cases because analytics is an overloaded word. It means different things to different people. So we'll, do a, we'll spend a lot of time on demos that uh, showcase those three use cases. But before we do that, I wanted, you guys, I wanted to walk you guys through the architecture behind our analytics platform. So conceptually, we think of, when we think of analytics, we think of this workflow. You're collecting data. Your data is being collected by the APM agents that are already present in your application. We are collecting structured data as part of business transactions, as part of browser ROM, mobile ROM. But we're also collecting unstructured data from logs. We, are also we can also collect unstructured custom data. The next phase is then storing and indexing that data. We have a horizontally, uh, infinitely scalable horizontal uh, storage built on Elasticsearch. It's real time. You can publish events in a sub-second time frame. You can also query those events pretty fast. And then we have a visualization engine that's built on top of it. 
the visualization engine, if you're familiar with the 4.1 version of uh, analytics, supports a visual query language. In 4.2, we introduced a SQL-like uh, ADQL language, that's App Dynamics query language. We'll take a very deep look at it um, in tomorrow's session. And then you can always do ad hoc analysis on the data using any of these query paradigms. So under the hood, this is an architecture that you guys are familiar with if you've been using APM, if you've been using EUM. You have your own machines that have been instrumented by APM agents, or your client-side JavaScript code has been instrumented by EUM agent. All that data is going out to the controller via processor or directly. What we are saying now is, as part of the machine agent, we've added analytics monitor in it. So with a single switch, you can turn it on, and now the same APM agents can start collecting business data, but instead of sending it to the controller, they'll now send it to this horizontally scalable event service. Because this data is much more voluminous, it's much, uh, it's much more chatty, so this event service is not built on top of a relational database, it's built on top of Elasticsearch. And then you have a UI that runs across both the relational data store and the horizontally scalable data store. Um, the horizontally scalable data store, like I mentioned, is built on top of Elasticsearch. We have, uh, this is our current architecture where we use Kafka to store that uh, incoming events, provide persistence. We use Zookeeper, but you're, you're free to use your own uh, mechanisms if you have best practices and you use some other technologies for coordination and persistence, you're free, free, uh, you're free to use that. The important thing about this event service is that it's designed for storing petabytes of daily data volume. That's where it differs from the uh, controller piece, which is basically a MySQL database. If you're an on-prem customer, we, we advise that you start small, and then you s start adding nodes horizontally to that event service. You can use Zookeeper and Kafka, and we have some best practices and docs published around how you would scale those event services, but you're free to use your own technologies as well. Um, as far as the visualization is concerned, we have a very rich uh, visualization built on top of this. You can use a visual query language, like I mentioned. You can use a SQL-like ADQL language to query across uh, that data. And I'll show you more of that in the demo. Um, as far as what's new, we'll take a deep look at all the new features that are coming in 4.2, so I recommend that you attend the session tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. Tomorrow morning. So there's a session tomorrow morning that goes into detail of each of these features, what are the use cases that are built uh, around them, and how do they function, what do they look like, how do you use them. But um, I just wanted to give you a brief overview of what's coming in 4.2. So we've added role-based uh, role access control for security. We've added single sign-on. Uh, we've added the SQL-like query language for power users. We've added many, many things in the visualization engine. So in version one, you were limited to, uh, if you've been using 4.1 analytics, you were limited to having one dimension on X and one dimension on Y. In 4.2, that limitation goes away and you can add multiple dimensions on X and Y. Uh, there's also a couple of very cool new features, one of which Bhaskar demoed in the keynote yesterday, uh, that correlates your logs from multiple hosts with a single business transaction. So. Imagine a user clicks on a button on your website or a, or a button on your mobile app. That translates into one BT, uh, one distributed BT that spans five hosts on the back end. And every time that click travels through a host on the back end, you're writing stuff in the logs. We can now automatically correlate those logs for you. You don't have to go and pick a time range and come up with a search criteria and search the logs with that time range. That's autocorrelated, and we'll, we'll show you how we do that. Um, if you've been using the browser analytics and mobile analytics, that was beta in uh, 4.1. That's going GA in 4.2. And again, we'll talk more about that in tomorrow's session. So uh, I recommend that you attend that. But I wanted to save most of the time today for demos. And then if you have any questions and uh, any things that we can answer here by showing you different demos or otherwise, let's do that. So bear with me while I um, switch to the demos. Okay. 
So what I'm going to use for demos today is a, is a demo banking application. It's a, it's a loan application where the customers are submitting different types of loans. They're logging into your uh, website. The loan application goes through three stages. It's submitted, then the documents for those loan applications are verified, then somebody on the bank's side checks the user's credit score for approval, then somebody else tries to insure that, and uh, if it's insured, then the application is finally approved. So it goes through multiple stages and we'll show how you can uh, get analytical insights from such an application. So the first thing that I wanted to do was uh, talk about, go back to Mike's use cases and talk about advanced performance analytics. Advanced performance analytics is about slicing your APM data, your key metrics like calls per minute, average response time, number of errors, by different dimensions. You want to build a dashboard for a particular customer. Now you can slice the APM data by that customer and do that. You want to build a dashboard for a particular company. Now you can slice that uh, by that company or a customer type or a product if you want to. So here what I have is in the last three hours, the number of errors that I saw were 236. The response time, average response time per application, loan application type were these. Uh, calls per minute for different business transactions were around here, and the average response time for business transaction is here. Now, if I wanted to segment this data by one of my uh, favorite customers, I know he comes to my website a lot, and in fact, I can easily do that. So I can segment the same APM data by Colin, and I know that in the last three hours, Colin experienced two errors. His response, he submitted uh, three types of loan applications. He logged into the website and he submitted applications. He didn't do anything else. And the average response time that he saw was this. This is just, the customer name is just a proxy for something else that you could use. If you have product type you want to slice and dice by, you're an e-commerce site. Or if you have, if you're airlines and you want to slice and dice by silver, gold, platinum, or any other dimension, you can now do that. You can also save these widgets to a dashboard and share those dashboards anonymously with those customers. So instead of manually reporting on that data to those customers, if you want to tell them, hey, here's a URL. Whenever you feel like you want to know how we are performing for you, just log into this URL and you'll see a, a summary of all the performance data for your interactions or people in your company um, with our website. So that's an example of that. The other thing um, that came in, uh, in 4.2 was the ability to, by the way, this is our, uh, our UI-based widget builder. Here's a bunch of widgets that you could choose, and here are all the transactions and fields that we collect. So application, business transaction, error code, error type, these are some of the fields that we collect by default. Loan amount, loan ID, loan type, username, these are some of the fields that I'm collecting using data collectors. So if you've used APM before, and if you've used, uh, if you've set up data collectors for snapshots, those are the same data collectors that will appear here. With just a checkbox, all of those data collectors will appear here for every single business transaction, as opposed to being able to see them for only transaction snapshots. So uh, what I wanted to do was, um, AppDynamics does a great job of dividing your response time into dynamic baselines and scorecards based on those dynamic baselines. So we automatically tell you uh, how many of your transactions were slow, how many of your transactions were normal, how many of were very slow, which ones errored out. But what if you wanted to divide them into static buckets? What if you want to divide them into zero to five seconds static bucket and then export that out as a CSV and attach that in an email, send it off to someone else? Or you had a contract with some other client of yours who had a strict SLA-based requirement and you wanted to see how many of your transactions for this particular customers were less than, let's say, 500 milliseconds. So you can now easily do that. Um, I can drop response time here. I can drop my, um, so this, as soon as you drop the response time on the x-axis, we automatically categorize it in buckets. But you can now choose to say that, let's start this bucket from zero, I want fixed increments of 
uh, 500, and let's say I keep the maximum at auto. And then I do a save. This will automatically bucket your transaction response time into different buckets that you want. You can then later export this data or use this data for your SLA-based reporting and whatnot. Um, the next thing you can do is, again, you can uh, go back to my friend Colin and see how that worked out for him. Yes? I'm sorry? Because it's not average response time, we're collecting every single time for every single transaction. In APM, we do average response time. Do what's going on? I'm sorry? So, what exactly is this? This is saying that in the last three hours, you had 35 calls where the response time was between zero to 500. This is counting the number of transactions where the response time was in this bucket. This is counting the number of transactions between 500 and 1,000. So this is showing you the raw count behind the uh, average response time that surfaces on the APM side. Make sense? Okay. Um, so the next thing that I wanted to demo was uh, another use case that Mike mentioned, which was business impact. So business impact is about outages. If your application had an outage, what was the impact of that outage on your business? You have a banking application or you have an e-commerce site, something goes wrong, there's an outage, a message queue is not available, a database is not available, you're serving errors. APM is a great way to go and fix those errors. APM will show you all the troubleshooting information you need to go from your pages all the way to your database to your SQL queries and see what's erroring out or what's slow. But if you want to go back to your boss and say, you know, I need one more headcount because this outage happens very frequently, the boss is going to ask, what's the impact of that outage on my business? Does it, do I lose enough amount to give you another headcount? This is a way to get that information. So again, I'm going back to the loan application. What I'm doing is, in the last one hour, I have filters for this application. I have submit application transaction selected, which is the transaction that happens when a customer submits a loan application. And then I have user experience error. So in the last one hour, 80 loan applications were impacted by error. The loan amount that was being applied for was this. The loan types that were being applied were 49% <coughs> were personal loans, 28% uh, were car loans, the rest of them were home loans. Uh, the loan type per different, uh, the loan amount per different type was this. So you can see that uh, the loan amount for home loans is greater than, which is kind of expected. And if you have an e-commerce site and you're dissecting this data by products, you can see which product was the one that was impacted heavily and you can then do another ad hoc analysis, excuse me, <coughs> for that product and, and get those insights. Here's a list of all the customers that were impacted in the last one hour. Another cool thing, <coughs> sorry, I'm getting caught in mouth. Another cool thing that you can do here is uh, you can switch over to the data tab and export this whole thing as a CSV. So now you can go back to your uh, <coughs> marketing team or you can go back to your customer support team and say, uh, let me pull up the <coughs> usernames. These are the users that were impacted by the <coughs> last outage. And the marketing team can then send them a $5 coupon and say, hey, we know. You logged on to our website in the last three hours. You experienced bad performance. Here's a $5 coupon. Why don't you come back and try that again? or your customer service can proactively reach to your clients and say, we know there was an outage, we know you logged on to our website, we know you were trying to submit a loan application, um, that error has been fixed, this was the reason, uh, just in case you didn't know this was happening. So that's, that's the reasoning behind the business impact uh, use case where you can go and 
proactively reach out to those customers who were impacted by an outage. The third thing that uh, Mike mentioned was usage analytics. So this is about the who, where, what of uh, your customers, your products, etc. One of the questions, if I'm running a banking application, one of the questions that I want answered is, a lot of people come and apply for bank loans. Where is the drop off? We have a new widget this, uh, in, in this release, which is a funnel widget. You can use the funnel widget to calculate drop offs. So here's a list of all the applications that were submitted in the last one hour. I can easily add a funnel step. And say that uh, I know that all the in my application, all the loan applications that make it to this tier are the ones whose documents have been approved by some employee of my company. So I can see that the drop off between the number of applications submitted and the number of applications whose documents were verified was this much. I can then go another step and find out how many of these documents finally make it to the approval stage where the credit scores of the customers behind these applications have been approved. Again, these are filters. Depending on your application, you'll select different filters. In this demo application, different stages are marked by business transactions. In your application, they could be marked by business transactions. They could be marked by tiers, nodes, fields, uh, or any such thing. And you can do that. You can do that. You can close the builder, add it to your widget. Uh, you can slice the same data to answer questions like what kind of loan applications are coming in most. Is it personal loan, car loan, home loan? What are the user experience on average when people apply for car loans versus personal loans? And uh, just the count of, count of that data. So that's an example of the usage analytics use case. Any questions on these so far? I'm sorry. Oh. So basic search is a is a UI based search language which is meant to target start users who are starting out with the product. You're seeing a bunch of fields on the left hand side. Um, you're seeing a button here. I'm looking for, of the three applications in this controller, I'm looking at the ADQL application. Of all the business transactions in the ADQL application, I'm looking at the submit application. So this gives you a basic way of doing ad hoc analysis on your data. You can slice that data by different fields. You can also um, click on one of these fields and see who are your top 10 users. You can click on that, add those users automatically to the filter. That's a basic way of querying this data. But the advanced mode, the advanced mode is meant for more, more for power users. If you're familiar with what you're doing, if you've come to this application often enough, if you've been using our analytics product often enough, you want to do complex queries, you want to do aggregation queries, you can come and do it here. Um, for example, if I were to do the same thing in ADQL, this will, using IntelliSense, prompt me at every step of the way. So this is the application that I want to do. And let's say I'm looking for loan type car. And let's say I'm looking for um, loan amount or where's customer name or username equal to any of these users, it'll prompt you along the way and you can do it faster. As we build this, as we build more features and more richness into the product, you'll see more and more complex queries being uh, driven through this UI rather than the basic UI. So we'll keep the basic UI for customers who are starting with the product and build more and more complex richness here. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. So 
there's, if you see on the left hand side, there's flexibility in the type of errors that you're looking at. Um, if you have error codes in your system, we are capturing things like error details, error types. These are all coming from the APM side. So all the data that you're seeing in your snapshots, except for the call graph, error details, which include if you have HTTP error codes, those. If you have exceptions, then the call stack. You have class names. All those things are coming here, and you can search by them. You can filter by them. If you then go into the APM side and use custom loggers, if you're familiar with the APM product, you can use custom loggers to define custom error conditions on BTs. They'll come through here as well. So those BTs would be marked as errors, and that will show up as the error user experience. So all those will just flow into this UI from the APM side. There was a question there. Not today. You can't trigger custom actions based on analytics results today. There's a roundabout way of doing it today, which is you create a metric. So let's say I have the search. I can save the search as uh, demo apps for your search. And then in the search list, there's a create metric button that you can use to create a metric out of the search, which will basically show you the count of all the results that satisfy the search in that time period. And that query is going to be executed once every minute. So you now have a time series metric of the results of the search. Now, once you have that, you can treat that metric as any other metric, create health rules based on that. Now you have policies based on those health rules. But there's no direct way of doing that from this UI. Okay. Yes. You will have to create roles for certain users. Then for those roles, you have uh, granular control over field types. For transactions, if you're looking at logs, you have control over source types. You have control over application. You have con different controls on different levels. Um, so. Custom fields are, whether you define an APM or whether you define them here, it's the same. It's the same UI here or there. The way you define them is you declaratively specify, so this demo application was built on Java. If it's Java, C Sharp, you can declaratively specify um, the class name, the method name, <coughs> the, uh, the parameter that you're trying to pick, the return value that you're trying to pick. And you'll get that here. But notice these checkboxes. <coughs> whether you specify them here or whether you specify them APM, we'll start collecting them and showing them based on what you have checked here. If you have selected transaction snapshots, these values will appear in both snapshots and analytics. If you have only analytics, these will be surface only in analytics. Yeah. In 4.2, these queries are accessible via REST API. You'll use the same ADQL um, you'll use the same ADQL based queries to extract the data. Yes, you'll send an ADQL search query and you'll extract the results at. Or you could just join our company. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But that's, yeah. So if you want to extract that result set out and send it to a different tool, you have a homegrown tool. Or App Dynamics application analytics become is part of a pipeline of a tools that, that you have. That's what this is meant for. It's coming along. By the time we release it in 4.2, which is January, 
you'll have it on docs.appdynamics.com. Yeah. Correct. Both, both. We have best practices laid out for that. Once you start using it, if you're an on-prem customer, you'll have our customer support team will, which will help you out with uh, scaling your own event service. We would recommend that you start out small based on your load. We'll take a look at how much data you're trying to collect, recommend a size of a cluster, and then you can horizontally scale it. In 4.2, the other thing that's coming out is platform admin app. So you don't have to manually scale and manually create it. You can, using platform admin, you can run a script and it'll automatically do it for you. But there, yeah. Yes. So the retention in our SaaS platform comes in uh, four intervals. You can, by default, it's seven, seven days. You can choose to go 30 days, 60 days, or 90 days. On prem, the default is 90 days. Sorry. Go ahead. Yes. You can choose to store it for less. Yeah. So if you have snapshots that are already collecting custom data, then we are already capturing that data but discarding it because we only surface it for snapshots. So there's no additional overhead. But if you pick a BT and add 50 different data collectors to it, then you are instrumenting 50 more methods at least, or potentially maximum 50 more classes, and that's an overhead. So it's directly proportional to how much custom data you're trying to collect. But again, the, the maximum overhead in our entire solution from EUM to analytics comes from collecting call graphs during transaction snapshots. Analytics does not collect call graphs. We're just collecting parameter values, so individually it's almost nothing. Um, are you asking me how much data can an on-premise event service store? Yeah. Yeah. So, so again, it depends on how distributed your business transaction. If you're talking about business transaction, but typically, on an average, when we look at our SaaS platform, when we do analysis of our own SaaS platform, uh, on an average, a BT is about three to four tiers. It's distributed three to four tiers. If you're collecting data, four data collectors from each of those tiers, typically the size for the entire document which stores data from all those tiers is one to 1.2 KB. And then you multiply it by the load that's coming in, and then you factor in the retention. How long do you want to store that data for? And that'll give you a size of and if you start to deploy on-prem, there's sizing guides available about what types of machines to use, what, what types of processors you need, how much RAM, how much hard disk you need. And there's our customer support team that works with us on our SaaS platform, which will help you out in your deployment as well. Sorry, you had a question? License. So license depends on the type of uh, data that you're looking at. Transaction is a factor of number of calls per minute that are coming in. Log is just a factor of volume that you're sending. Uh, browser licenses will be tied to your RUM licenses. So RUM licenses are given based on 10 million page views per year. So browser analytics will be, uh, will be tied to that. It'll be a factor of that. And similarly, mobile analytics license will be tied to mobile product, which is monthly active, 5,000 monthly active users which is one license unit. So analytics on that would be tied to that. It's tied to the data set. The custom data set, um, for example, if I wanted to send, um, I was just playing with this uh, a few days ago, and actually maybe more than a few days ago. Uh, 
um, and I was trying to get stock price for, for Apple into the same Elasticsearch store, into our analytics store. So that's custom data. That'll again use the same licensing model that transactions use. You have, for one license unit, half a million events per day. Yes? Yeah, so let's, let's do that. So let's say I have transaction data in the same application. Um, I'm looking at AD Capital, the same loan application that I was demoing. Somebody calls me and says, hey, there's a problem with your customer login. In this scenario, there are no errors with the customer login, but here's your uh, transaction. You can now, just to do it again, you can now double click go to more details. We have a unique request GOID that identifies each click that travels through your system. You can click search logs, and we'll show you all the logs that were collected from different machines, different hosts, for that particular transaction. So if you wanted to look at host, you can see I'm getting logs from AD Portal, I'm getting logs from REST. Um, if I went back and looked at the transaction again, you would notice that there are two tiers, Portal and REST. I'm collecting logs from there. And if you have any errors that are coming up in the logs, you'll see them here automatically. Yeah? So the, the you know, data is, is only for maximum 90 days, right? But is there a way to export data because really sales analytics, some of, some of the events are yearly, so they may compare how was last year, right? So is there a way that to export this data out? Yeah. So the question is, the maximum retention in, uh, in analytics is 90 days, and is there a way to export this data out? In 4.2, which is going to be released in January, there's a REST API that you can use to export data out, and then store it locally or store it somewhere else if you want to. Any other questions? Yeah. I didn't, didn't see you. Yeah, that's a good question. For the customers, so the question is, for those customers that are using analytics already, which organization, which department in the company do you see driving the usage of analytics? Um, we are still seeing a heavy, more than heavy usage on the DevOps side. The most popular use case for existing customers is advanced performance. Um, to be more specific, the most, pop, the most common thing that they want to do is uh, slice the response time, slice the load on the website, errors by a particular customer or by a particular company. So someone, and there's, an, there's a, another handful of customers who want to do that by URL. So I'm a company that maintains eight to nine URLs, some end in co.uk, some end in .com, some co.singapore, and I want to see the performance of my applications based on the URLs that are being hit. I have some shared components, I have some specific components that are specific to those geos, but I want to get an aggregate sense of what the experience is for, for customers that are hitting Singapore versus UK. So slicing and dicing based on URLs by customer name, by so you have five marquee customers, you want to build dashboards for those five marquee customers. That's a very common use case that we are seeing. And that's, that's very close to DevOps. Yeah. Yeah. What if you already have a log of pages on the uh from a different vendor? By us? No, we would recommend just by us. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Um uh no, I'm just kidding. It it depends on your use case, right? If you if you already have a log product which is serving your needs well, if you're deriving all the insights that you want of want from it, if it's not cost prohibitive. Um, then for all, by all means continue to use that. But then again, we are going to invest in our log product. We have a fixed number of resources on our disposal. We are going to invest in our log product, we are going to build our log product, and 
we are going to try to integrate it seamlessly with the transactions that we have and the browser data that we are catching and all those other, caching and all those other things, right? So at some point in time, you'll have to decide whether you want to have two tools or one, which is I think something that Mike pointed out to in his uh, application about silos and having different tools. So, and, and let me let me add something, right? So. So if you think about it, like we talked a lot about logs is just one data source, right? So if you have a vendor where you're collecting logs, it's really a good piece of information, right? But then what about your data that's coming from business transaction, right? So our ability to automatically identify a business transaction, pair that with log, you're not going to get that, right? And then what about the mobile data? What about the browser data? So actually, if you don't mind, can you go to that um, 4.2 slide that we have? So you know, if you just really think about it, the power of any analytics pro uh, platform is going to come from how richer your data set is, right? How, how richer that is, how up-to-date it is, and how it allows you to tie everything together, right? So, so we are doing nest nested search today, but we're going to be able to do a lot of different cool things where you can say, hey, give me this username and give me this username for this person that went across all these different types of data sets, right? Being able to coordinate all that together and say, hey, this user was on browser, was on mobile, here's some log data, you know, there's transaction data, being able to pair that all together. And like Amode said, I mean, at some point you're going to have to decide whether you want one platform, one tool, or multiple, right? Um, and, and that's just the reality of it. So I'll, I'll take two more questions, and I think then we have to vacate the room for other folks. Yeah. But I'm, I'm, I'll be here, so happy to chat with you. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. So log licensing is based on the amount of log data that you're sending us. So one log license unit lets you store five gigabytes of data for seven days. If you want to buy retention, you can buy retention on top of that. Absolutely, you can go and monitor whatever log you want. It, this is just a demo of, so in this demo what I'm trying to show is when your business transaction is flowing through different machines and flowing through different JVMs, each thread in that JVM is doing something and logging some information. I'm trying to filter those logs for a particular good. But yeah, absolutely, you can collect logs from uh, Nginx. If you don't have an agent for Nginx, you can collect logs from Nginx. You can collect logs from whatever sources. We've got a bunch of job files. And if you, if you attend the session tomorrow morning, we'll go in much more details on how do we grok log patterns out, which, how do we use job files, what do we do there. So we'll take a very deep dive into that tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. So when you, when you use your, when you install the on-premise analytics service, you'll find a very simple installation and an installation that's geared to get you up and running fast. And then up and running fast in a small environment for you to test it out. Three node environment, seven node environment. And when I say a small environment, I mean millions of metrics per day. So it's meant for you to start out there and when, if you want to scale beyond that. So our SaaS environments is hundreds of nodes. And for hundreds of nodes, these are the technologies we chose for persistence and for uh, coordination and we have best practices around those you and we'll help you with those but if you if you're an expert and you want to use something else thanks guys so uh, Mo and I will be here if you guys have questions just come on by yeah. thank you